Blender geometry nodes are fantastic, but mystifying too, right? It can be pretty hard to know where to start when you actually want to create something yourself. That's why this video is here for you. Because today we'll cover these three examples. And they're special in that they each hold some very important foundational techniques when it comes to this amazing feature. So without further ado, let's start with the first example. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More about them later in the video. We're gonna start with this magnet toy. And it might look simple at first, but you can use this for any mesh and it has some interesting features. So we're gonna start by pressing Shift A and let's add an icosphere with one subdivision. And I'm also gonna make a new geometry nodes group. Here we can also add a new node by pressing Shift A uh, and let's get a mesh to points node. This will transform the vertices of our mesh into points. Now to see the original mesh, we will use a joint geometry node. And the next step is to render the points as a mesh. And we're gonna do that by using an instance on points node. And let's instance a UV sphere. Here we go, that's way too big. So let's lower that radius for a bit so it looks a little better. And we can also see that it's still shaded flat. We can fix that by using a set shade smooth node. So your geometry will look nice and smooth. For the tubes, we need to turn the mesh into a curve. So let's connect our original geometry to this mesh to curve node. And we can press Control shift left mouse button to activate a viewer node. This way we view only the curves. And we can view the instances as well by getting a new join geometry node. And if you turn on X-ray, you'll see that parts of our curve are inside the sphere and we want to get rid of them. Luckily, we can do that using a trim curve node. And let's set it to length for now. But we have to ask ourselves, how much do we actually have to trim off of the curve? Well, if we take a look at our geometry, you will see that it's actually the radius of our sphere. So if we take an input value and plug it into the radius and plug the same one into the start of the trim curve, uh, you will see that part of the problem is fixed. But still, we have curves that intersect the sphere. Now the parts intersecting are the endpoints of the curve, but we can't trim the endpoints in the same way. So what we have to do uh, is we have our original curve of which we trimmed the start and then we reverse that curve and trim the start again. And we do that by using a reverse curve and another trim curve node. And we just plug the same value into the start and the end values we're gonna make a really big number like 100 meters. And you'll see that the curves now end where the sphere begins. And this is great. So let's make the tubes by converting the curve into a mesh. And for a profile curve, we're actually gonna use a square. Uh, and you'll see why in a second. Now to get a square, we use a quadrilateral node. And if we connect it up, you'll see that it's way too big. So let's lower the width and the height. Also, we want to fill the caps of our tube. To make it easier to control, I'm just gonna connect a new value to our width and height. And by pressing N, we can actually change the names of our inputs in the group menu. Finally, we can put a math node set to add between our value and the trim curve node uh, to actually trim the curve a little bit more. And as to why we're using a square profile, well, if we add a bevel modifier, you can see that it makes tubes with rounded ends, which is very important. A problem, the original mesh that we join later also gets beveled, but the UV spheres on the other hand do not get beveled. So why is that? Well, if you remember, the UV spheres are instances and you should think of instances as points in disguise. And can we bevel a point? Well, no. So let's use this fact to our advantage by turning the original geometry into an instance and you'll see it won't get beveled. You can fix these artifacts by adding another geometry nodes group and just adding a merge by distance node. And if anything is shaded flat, you might wanna add a set shade smooth node as well. And as a final touch, we can set separate materials for the balls, the tubes and the faces. And there you go, you have this procedural magnet toy or wireframe system. Now, when working in geometry nodes, having a basic understanding of mathematical principles will definitely help you. And that's why brilliant.org is one of my favorite things to use. And I'll tell you why. It's the best way to learn math and computer science interactively. So I already use Brilliant before they reached out to me because what they offer is concise visual explanations about complex topics. And they do it in a very engaging way. Kind of like what I'm trying to do with these videos. And they have a wide variety of courses that includes thousands of lessons at different levels. You could seriously level up your Blender skills by learning more about vector math, geometry, computer science, as well as foundational through advanced math and a lot more topics. These lessons, by the way, of which new ones are posted every month, are also bite-sized. So it's really easy to get started because they almost feel like fun little minigames. 
I really enjoyed the course on logic. Here you really get tested on your reasoning and it makes you think about the situation in a broader sense so you can fully understand it. You can try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days. Visit brilliant.org slash straycreations or click the link in the description. And the first 200 people to sign up through that link will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Massive thanks to Brilliant and let's get on with the video. This next group uses a curve as base geometry. You can see it taper off, you can extend it as far as you want. And the end point also rotates correctly with the curve. So let's get started. You can add any kind of curve you want. And I'm just gonna draw mine like this. And once we have our geometry nodes turned on, the first node we will add is a subdivide curve node. And we just subdivide the curve a couple times. And just like before, we turn it into a mesh with a profile curve, uh, but this time our profile curve will be a curve circle. Make sure to pick the curve circle and not the mesh circle. And let's connect that up and it will be way too big again, uh, but we can play with the radius. Except this time we also add a set curve radius node. And it seems to do the exact same thing, but with this node we can actually connect a field. And we're going to use the spline parameter node for that. Viewing the factor output of this node shows us that it outputs 0 at the start of the curve and 1 at the end of the curve. So connecting this to our radius already gives us a taper, except it goes in the opposite direction. Let's also fill the caps of this curve. And to customize our curve shape we will get a float curve. Uh, and with this node we can just set any shape that we want. We can reverse the taper, but we can also pinch it even more or make it wider or make a totally different shape. Now to put an object on the endpoints, uh, we again use an instance on points node. And this time we just directly connect our curve to the point input. I'm again going to instance a UV sphere, but you can use any object you want. Uh, and using the endpoint selection node, we can select just the endpoint. I'm viewing just the instances at the moment. So let's just join that geometry and we will see the curve come back. And we can also set the desired radius for our UV sphere. Now to grow this curve we can use a trim curve node, uh, but we will also see the first problem. And it's not that visible with the UV sphere, so I'll just quickly instance a cube instead. And you will see that it doesn't follow the rotation of the curve. And we're going to fix that using the rotation input on the instance on points node. Now the curve tangent node will give us the heading of the curve, but we have to turn this into a rotation. Uh, and we can do that using the align Euler to vector node. We just input the tangent into the vector input and connect the rotation output to our instance on points node. And you will see that the instances now rotate with the curve. Pretty neat. But to make this node group really shine, we need one more node and it has to do with the factor of the curve. Again, factor outputs zero at the start of the curve and one at the end of the curve. Uh, but when we view this factor all the way at the end, when it's turned into a mesh, uh, you will see that the whole thing is black. It doesn't give us any output. So to fix that, we're going to store the curve factor earlier in the node tree using a store named attribute node. We just connect it up after our trim curve node and connect the factor to the value input. We can just give it any name we want. And this way, by using a named attribute node, we can use the factor of the curve after it's been turned to a mesh. Which is not only useful for making selections in geometry nodes, but you can also use it in the material editor. If you want to dive even deeper, you can download this free node group on my Gumroad, which is basically a more advanced version of this system. The third and final example is definitely my favorite of the three. And in this setup, we're using math nodes to combine multiple sine waves with each other to get some very cool results. Now we can start with any object. It really doesn't matter because we're not using the input geometry. Instead, we'll add a mesh line. Let's connect that up and we'll set the Z output to be very low. I'm going to set it to 0.005. This increases the resolution, but also makes it shorter. So we can pull on this value to extend our line. Now we want to go ahead and add a set position node as well. And we'll use the offset values to get our spiral shape. Let's start with a position node uh, and we're going to add a separate XYZ node. This separates the position vector into the X, Y and Z components and we can combine them together at the end to create our final vector. Now in this case we connect the Z output to the X input, creating a linear function. Now to turn it from diagonal to wavy we just need the sine of this function. We can do that using a math node set to sine. Now we're getting started. I'm going to spare doing every node one by one and just skip to this equation. This is the general equation you'll need to generate any sine wave you want. 
And as you can see, in Node you basically express this function backwards. We can make it 3D by duplicating these two nodes at the end, but we're going to change the sine wave to a cosine. And if we connect them up, we have a similar equation ready for the Y input. And this results in this slinky shape, and we can still change our parameters to get different results. Now we want to bring a second wave into the mix. I'm just going to pull some nodes out to create some room. And we want to duplicate this multiply and sign node. And we're going to put it over here and connect our add value to the input. This will make a separate wave that we can use separate parameters for. And we're going to blend the two together using two mix nodes. One for each of the equations we just made. And after unchecking the clamp factor on both nodes, we connect our value to the factor of both nodes. We can now start playing with the new parameter and you will see that we can create some very interesting shapes. And if we bring it down to zero, we get the shape that was featured in the example. You can grow this shape using the count on the mesh line node. Uh, and if you bring the multiply node the other way, you can get some very different shapes that are also really cool. And by just adding another multiply node after the sine node up here, we can get some more control over that secondary wave. Now, the rest of this setup is very easy. We just get a mesh to curve node and curve to mesh like before with a circle as profile curve. This time we will drive the radius of the curve with the length of the position vector. And basically what we're looking for is the distance between the origin, which is the middle and every element. So every point on the curve, we can do that using the length node, but you can see that it doesn't work properly. That's because it's also taken into account the Z position uh, and that messes it up. So we just multiply the Z component by zero. And we can use the same multiply node to just thin out our curve a little bit. And yeah, that's how you make the shape in the example. You can create your own shape and add a material. Don't forget to add a set material node as well. And if you encounter any artifacts, uh, most of them can be solved by just plugging a merge by distance node at the end. Um, I'm going to connect all my values up to my group input. So I have some easy sliders to work with. And yeah, just look at that. I love to play with this setup. That brings us to the end of this video. Um, I hope you liked this video. It was kind of different from most of my uploads. Uh, I'm trying out different content styles. So let me know if you liked the video. Uh, let me know if you disliked it. I will probably be back with face cam soon. I've been sick for the past like week or two weeks, but I'm slowly getting better. And uh, yeah, I like doing face cam. So I'm probably going to continue doing that. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like. And you can also subscribe to stay tuned for future videos. And with that, I'll see you later. Bye bye.